Hello and welcome back. Okay, in the last video, I added some digital input and output lines to the CPU build, and we did a little bit of experimentation with those. In this video, I want to start looking at analog signals, specifically analog input. Now, these days, you'd automatically go to an analog to digital converter. Most microcontrollers have them built in, and those parts are pretty cheap. But in the early days of computing, particularly gaming, there was a need for analog input and they used a different approach. And so I want to talk about that. Now, I have here an analog PC joystick. It's got nice smooth motion, but the controller cards that interface to these, when I looked at those when I was younger, yeah, they didn't seem to have the complexity of components that I expected. So they were clearly doing something else. There were also a lot of early gaming systems that used a rotary paddle as input. And inside those was just a potentiometer like this one. And what I'd like to do today is look at the means that those systems would interface those analog inputs into the digital world, but without the complex circuitry that you might expect. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so if you open one of these joysticks up, you'll find that inside is just two potentiometers, one on the horizontal and one on the vertical axis. So the game paddles obviously just had a single potentiometer and let's start there. Going to need an extra bit of breadboard. Gonna cross connect power and ground. And now we want to build a circuit that can detect the resistance of this potentiometer. Obviously, we could generate a voltage, pass that through an analog to digital converter, and we'd be using several components, some of which would be comparatively expensive, at least back in the day. But the, there was a different technique used, and I want to look at that, and that's just going to start with a capacitor. The idea is very simple. We start with an empty capacitor, and then we charge it up through the variable resistance in the potentiometer and the amount of time it will take to attain the full charge is going to be dependent on the current setting of the pot. Right, so the working principle is very simple. We're gonna discharge the capacitor, charge it up through the potentiometer, so different values of the pot will alter the charge speed. So we want a circuit that can programmatically discharge it and time how long it takes to recharge. And going with a 555 timer is a good start. Now there's multiple ways you could build this circuit, but I've seen it done with one of these before. In fact, I will provide a link to EV blogs video where he mentions this just because I used it in reference for, for this circuit. Let's start off with power and ground. Now the ground line is not in the bottom right like it is with most of the TTL chips we deal with. It's important to not forget that. The two lines in the middle at the top here are discharge and fresh hold. We're gonna tie those together because we're interested in discharging and sensing the current level of the capacitor. Let's tie the other end of the cap to ground. Now we want to tie reset high. We've got a trigger line. When we transition that low is when the capacitor is going to be allowed to float. Now, if we're designing a PCB, we really should put a low value capacitor between the control line and ground, but I'm not going to bother on the breadboard here because it doesn't make much difference to us. We want to charge up the capacitor so let's plug this in between five volts and one side of the cap. And I'm gonna get the oscilloscope on and we'll take a bit more of a look at this. I'm gonna start off by getting the yellow trace onto that trigger line. And I'm gonna connect the trigger line to the low bit of our GPIO output. Let's watch the charge level on the capacitor with the purple trace. Okay, so we're interested in a low going pulse, changing the oscilloscope to trigger on any change at the moment. Okay, so we see the voltage start to rise there. I'm gonna need to adjust the scope by a lot. Okay, now that's uh, that's certainly looking promising. I think we need a lower value capacitor though. This was a 100 nanofarad cap. I'm gonna go to the extremes and go for a one. 
Okay, that's pretty good. Now we want some kind of regular pulse out of this. So let's go ahead and write some code to get us a regular pulse on this line. Start by declaring a loop and I'm gonna paste in a chunk of code I've been using for this kind of work. So this is just jumping back to the loop point but it's checking to see if there's anything incoming in the UART buffer, just so any key is gonna stop. Other than that, it will just repeat what it's doing indefinitely. Let's clear out A. Output that to the GPIO. Set that bottom bit just with an increment and output that. So that will give us a bit of a square wave, but I think we want a longer delay. Save C just in case. So this is just gonna loop 256 times till C wraps round. That's a, probably gonna be an okay little delay to start. Okay, it's a little 48 byte program. Okay, paste that in and give it a run. Adjusting the potentiometer, we actually get a nice modification on that slope until if I make it too low, it suddenly all goes wrong. And okay, it's pretty obvious in hindsight what's happening there because the discharge line here is basically just clamping down to ground and the potentiometer at its extreme is pretty much just connecting that same line to five volts. So we're kind of creating a dead short across the 555 timer. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab some resistors. Okay, so that's nice and stable now. So all I've done there is put a resistor in series with the output of the potentiometer. Now this was a 15K resistor and these are 100K potentiometers. So we're now basically creating a resistance from 15 to 115 instead of zero to 100. Let's have a look at the output line. There we have a digital looking signal. So now what we need is we need to write some code that times how long this signal is high for between the pulses. Let's test that bottom bit. Let's initialize C to zero. Okay, so we're testing if that bottom bit is set and if it is, we jump back to count. So we increment C once each time we go through the loop. So we should finish here with C equaling the total count. Now I want to print the number out. So I'm gonna convert it from a number to a string. Give that a go. So we should be able to stop that with a key, load the new code and run that. Okay, that's not having any effect. Oh. Output line to bit in. That's promising. Okay, so we're going from 9 up to 55. 
That's not an unreasonable range. I like it, it works. It's kind of awesome actually, because what we've done here is created a simple analog input. Now, if you look at some of the old classic kind of Pong style games with their rotary paddles, this is exactly how they did it. Now we've used a 555 timer here and a couple of discrete components, which is very little. I've actually heard about this circuit being done with just a diode and a couple of discrete components, although you're relying on the digital inputs consistency of, um, of its detection threshold there, rather than using the comparator inside the timer. But you know, this kind of circuit is incredibly simple. I would like to see if I can uh, get the joystick going there. Right, so I've made this kind of DuPont style adapter and the potentiometers in here are 100 kilo ohm and that's what I selected for this one. So hopefully we should be able to get the first axis working very easily. Okay, so that's the vertical axis, and it's working how we'd expect. But now we need to build a second channel. And I think we can lose the oscilloscope. So I'm just going to duplicate out these. Let's power ground, reset. Let's get that little bridge between discharge and threshold. Right, my numerical range was a bit low there, so I'm going to take my one out and put 4.7s in, which is the next in my capacitor kit. Of a trigger, we can actually just share between them, and then we have a unique output. Okay, so with the different capacitor, the vertical axis now goes 35 up to 249. Okay, we need to be careful of that because obviously if we get all the way up past 255, it's a problem. But I think the code update is going to slow things down a little bit, so we'll be okay. Now I want to output the X and the Y, so I'm actually going to change to a pad free version of the number output. Now, we could read the x-axis, re-trigger, and read the y-axis, but it would be better if we could write the code to read them both at the same time. And this is an interesting challenge in its own right, because we want to be careful that we don't have multiple paths through the code that will cause the values to scale differently. Right, I'm actually going to do this a little bit differently. So let's take a copy of A into there. I'm going to zero out C and D. And just to simplify the code, I'm going to move the two input bits to the top of the byte. And then if I add B to B, the first axis is in the carry flag. I can do an ink with carry C and an ink with carry D. So if both bits are clear, we stop. We add the top bit to C and the next bit down to D. So C and D should have our relative counts in. Put a separator in, grab D, convert that to a number and output it. I'm gonna put a space in. Let's read the GPIO values in, write those out directly and do a new line. And of course we really don't need that delay anymore because converting these numbers to their ASCII representation is probably taking longer than that delay ever did. Right, so our program's up to 339 bytes now. Let's give that a run. Okay, I did say I was moving these to the top two bits. OK, 
Okay, well that's stopped. Don't like it. Okay, well that ink C was redundant. So we grab GPIO, take a copy and B. Apart from messing up C, this seems to be correct. interesting I had that line in the wrong place it was never pulling the line up so the loop never finished okay so I'm seeing slightly different values in rest between the horizontal and vertical and actually on the old PC joystick programs we used to often have a calibration step where you would be asked to center the joystick and then put it into different corners just to allow the code to adapt to what the natural values of the potentiometers were So that's X all the way to the left, all the way to the right. And up and down, all working perfectly. Now I was very careful to write that code such that no matter what value of the X and Ys, they would still produce equivalent values. It'd be very easy to accidentally write code that um, when the count for one axis had completed would loop at a slightly different rate for the other. Um, and obviously I've also outputted the general lines there. So I'm just going to see if I can grab five volt line and bottom two bits there. This is the GPIO lines. The bottom two bits now should map to the trigger buttons. So that's two for that one one for that one, or three if we're on both. This is awesome. So we've just with two 555 timers um, and a few discrete components, we've fully implemented an old style PC joystick. I'm really pleased with that. That's a nothing circuit and it works perfectly. Of course, now I'm going to have people demanding I write a flight simulator. Okay, I really enjoyed building this. Whole thing took less than an hour from beginning to end, but we've interfaced all the functionality of a PC analog joystick into the CPU build via our general purpose input output lines. And it was just a few components. I do like this capacitor timed method of analog input. It's a nice little callback to the way some of the early game systems work. And I think it's nice to be able to play around with these systems. I'm not going to be using this PC joystick interface as part of the main build going forward. This was really just a demonstration. I've always wanted to experiment with this kind of system. But I hope you found it interesting. As always, a big thanks to all my patrons. I really do appreciate the support. And to everyone, I'm really enjoying being able to show these bits of circuit to you. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.